Hey, motorcycle fans, I'm Larry Huffman, and this is the Blackwater 100 video. Along with Buddy Little and four-time Blackwater champion Mark Hyde, we're going to bring you the following home video entertainment made possible by Scott USA, manufacturers of high-performance motorcycle racing goggles and fashionable eyewear. Scott USA, the difference is clear. By Wiseco High Performance Motorcycle and ATV Pistons, forged from high silicone, low expansion aluminum alloy, Wiseco Pistons will increase the life of any cast iron line cylinder. By KTM Motorcycles, when you're caught between a rock and a hard place, turn to KTM and find out why a KTM motorcycle is built for champions. By Yokohama Tires, the official tire of the 1990 Blackwater 100. Yokohama, tires built for America's toughest race. By Dirt Bike Magazine, the off-road magazine America turns to. By Dirt Wheels Magazine, America's best source for Blackwater 100 ATV coverage. And by Cycle News, America's weekly motorcycle newspaper. Welcome to the 16th annual Blackwater 100. I'm Bud Little, and this is America's toughest motorcycle and ATV race. Each year on Father's Day weekend, thousands of off-road enthusiasts converge on the small community of Davis, West Virginia to witness two days of competition on some of the most difficult and challenging terrain that this country has to offer. For the participants, the sponsors, and the fans of two- and four-wheel racing, Canaan Valley is the place to be on the third weekend of every June. For the past 16 years, the town of Davis has opened its arms and its streets to the thousands of participants and their families for what has become an American racing classic. Go ahead. With me is the winningest rider in Blackwater history, four-time champion, Mark Hyde. Preparations can begin days, even weeks before a race like this, which lasts two hours for the ATVs and covers a distance of 100 miles for the motorcycles. The most necessary preparation may be waterproofing because the Blackwater is infamous for its bottomless swamps and water crossings. Just finishing this event is an accomplishment in itself. The Saturday morning is the busiest time for the MPs as the influx of visitors to the area hits peak level. As part of the 1990 AMA Weisco Yokohama Yamaha Grand National Cross Country Championship Series, the event will host the fastest and most successful racers in the off-road world. As the teams go through the pre-race ritual of last-minute preparation for the long and demanding event, the spectators pick out their vantage points in and around Davis. The town's businesses do their best to make sure that everyone has a great stay in Davis. The Blackwater 100 weekend is the most prosperous time of the year for the community merchants. Among first of orders of business for the event itself is the registration of all competitors and the drawing of starting positions. Another necessary task is transporting the numerous track personnel to their locations along the race course's 20-mile route. The Blackwater 100 began in 1974 as a motorcycle race, but since 1983, the town has also opened the event to all-terrain vehicles. The first Saturday race for the ATVs attracted about two dozen brave souls and was won by a local guy named Donnie Scud Huggins. Since that time, the event has grown to the point where the ATV race rivals the bikes in numbers and popularity. Nearly 500 competitors take to the streets on Saturday afternoons for their chance to ride the famed Blackwater 100 course. ATV publications like Dirt Wheels and Three and Four Wheel Action helped in the growth of this event after their editors traveled from California to participate and wrote rave reviews about their adventures. Following the 11 a.m. riders meeting, the competitors begin the slow process of pushing their machines through town to their respective starting positions along Main Street. The riders have drawn numbers from 1 to 500 in order to determine starting positions.
The signal is finally given at one o'clock. Riders, start your engines. The ATV competitors line up in four-man rows down along the end of Main Street. Obviously, just sitting there in all those fumes for a few moments before the start can be the most hazardous part of any rider's day. The start works simple enough. The riders wait on referee Russ Bennett to throw the green flag, signaling their time to begin the race. Bennett throws the flag every five seconds to allow a different group of riders to light off into the dust, which will probably be the only dust they see for the next two hours. Well-known woods pilot Teddy Trey explains what the race is like. It's rocky, it's a lot of, little bit of mud, a couple uphills seem pretty mild. Uh, it's going to be really a test of endurance rather than a, a test of endurance with the bike and the, and the man rather than just going out there and thrashing around and being the fastest rider. The dust and the pavement last for just a few yards. Then the riders encounter their first bottleneck. At the top of the bank, riders get antsy about having their turn in the water. But down lower, everyone is just trying to stay afloat. It's a race to hurry up and wait your turn to cross the Beaver Creek on the outskirts of town. The first rule of the Blackwater is never listen to the spectators. You may end up in over your head. Part of the Blackwater lore is that thousands of spectators come just to be entertained at the rider's expense. Further up the trail, the front runners are making their way into the spacious Canaan Valley, where most of the racing takes place. The early leader is Pennsylvania's Chuck DeLulo, runner up in last year's cross country series. DeLulo is a veteran of the Blackwater 100 and knows that the spectators can be as much an obstacle as any of the course's mud holes and creek crossings. While DeLulo zigzags his way through the early stages of the race on his Weissco equipped Brockway Honda 4 Tracks 250, Indiana's Bob Sloan comes into the picture. Sloan is a defending Grand National Champion in the Cross Country Series and is known for his aggressiveness. He makes it through this section with a little help from his friends. A lot of people might call that cheating, buddy, but at the Blackwater 100, if you've got friends, you better use them. Then comes the rest of the field. Racing the Blackwater can be a lot like playing chess. Every move must be thought out and calculated. The cliche, look before you leap, is embedded in every rider's mind. One false move can make for a long and tiresome day. A popular technique is to play follow the leader with the riders around you. That way, if he messes up, you get a second chance. If it looks like these riders are going around in circles, it's because they are. The race can be a giant dare. You go first. No, you go first. Exactly, Mark. It's the rider who gets up enough guts to take the risk to find the quickest but least muddiest line through this portion of the track. And that sets the standard for the other riders close behind. And this is why the experts say bravery and the ability to make a quick and good decision is what makes a Blackwater champion. Back to that first rule of thumb. If you are going to trust a spectator, at least listen to one that's dressed like a racer, because they probably know what it's like to spend a couple hours digging their machine out of a bog.
And don't be afraid to second guess yourself and back out of a situation. Reverse sure comes in handy in a race like this. That's right, as long as you don't back up into a mud bog. At the Blackwater, mud bogs can turn up in the most unexpected places. This guy asks for help, but then he can't make up his mind who to listen to. After circling around once, he gets a closer look at this fan's eyes and decides that this is a person he can trust. And it looks like by trusting this guy, everything worked out okay. What's good for the goose is good for the gander and everybody follows suit. And it's a good thing that somebody made that first decision to lead everyone else through because who knows how long these guys would continue running around in circles waiting for the other guy to make the first move. So it's through the muck and mud they ride. But as you can see, it's already starting to break down. A new route across will have to be found. And but it looks to me like this line through is just a little bit messy, which goes to prove that there are no clean lines through the black water. One more thing about spectators. No matter how they're dressed, never, never trust one with a camera. Can you imagine riding your first Blackwater and as your reward for trying, you end up as a poster on this guy's bedroom wall of Blackwater memories? Traction is a big part of this race. Someone pulling on the front end while you put your weight on the back is usually the best way out of a jam. However, you don't want to get too far back. Wow, that's called a Blackwater backflip. Scenes like these are why thousands of people travel from all over the country to witness firsthand some of the muddiest mud bog mania ever. This guy is determined to gas his way out of trouble. And with a little help from his newfound friends, he breaks through. Hey, can't someone tell him it's okay to let go of the bike just for a second? Now it looks to me like this guy is just hopping into this mud bog to take a mud bath. Hey mom, where's the soap? Riders may not want to ask for directions, but a helping hand is always welcome, and most times, a necessity. You can tell the more seasoned fans by the way they help extract riders from the mud. Working from the front, veteran fans will form a human chain to help a rider through. Your greener fans will jump right in and push from behind, actually causing a rider to lose traction. I just love this. This little boy gets up the nerve to help add a little traction to this situation. And just look at the result. Mud mixed with a lot of water. Yes, mission accomplished. Now comes the real work. Hey, Mom, time to do the laundry. Now, wouldn't this make a good detergent ad? Hey, where's that kid? Not this time, but a veteran fan comes to the rescue. You can also tell the experienced fan by his attire. They're quick to jump in and lend a hand. Funny you should mention that, because it looks to me like a lot of these spectators are fully dressed in army attire, and I guess that's pretty fitting. I've heard a few people refer to the Blackwater as the battle of the fittest. I guess you could say that riding the Blackwater is like being at war. And the concerns for the environment are genuine. Hey, you guys uh, getting paid to do this? Or? No, sir. We're just having fun. After miles in the valley of mud bogs, the hard ground and green forest of the Appalachian Mountains can be a welcome sight to a man and his machine. Talking about machines, this lonely machine just awaits the return of its master, as the Blackwater's mountainous terrain has proven too much for someone. This portion of the Blackwater is very interesting. Upon first view of this forest setting, one would think that these trees are embedded in nice, soft soil. But in reality, these trees are embedded in 100% hard, cold rock. If you look closely, the leaves that cover the Earth's floor are really covering those sharp, abrasive roots of these massive trees. The key to getting through this portion of the Blackwater is to stay on course and not to try any fancy lines. One false move and you could find yourself lost deep within the West Virginia forests with no way out, no gas, and only your feet for your guides. It may look like a leisurely trail ride through the woods, but even the peaceful forests of this area contain obstacles that can keep riders pushing all day long. The Blackwater 100 is as much a test of strength and endurance as it is a race of speed and skill. Just look at that forest floor. It's amazing to think that a powerful machine like that could actually get stuck in this particular spot. 
Not only do you have to contend with the rocks, the tree roots, and the trees, but the riders have to get up enough speed to ride up the mountainous terrain. Just past the halfway mark on the course, the arrows point the riders into the infamous Moon Rocks, a section of stones that run across the top of Hatfield Mountain and keep the riders occupied for over one mile of the race. Traditionally, the Moon Rocks proved to be an easy obstacle in comparison with racing motorcycles at the Blackwater. But if you're not careful, the Moon Rocks can present problems. Once you make it up the steep portion of the rock, it's pretty much easy sailing over the hill. So far, it's been river crossings, mud bogs, rocky mountainous terrain, and now moon rocks that these riders have to contend with. And they've not even completed one lap of the Blackwater course. This is America's toughest race. These sharp and jagged rocks are as formidable an opponent for some of the riders as the notorious bogs. I talked earlier with a few of the ATV participants, and they were telling me how important good ATV tires really are in racing the Blackwater. The tires have to be strong enough to take a beating at every point of the Blackwater. I even found out that there's a company called ITP that makes an ATV tire called the Blackwater. Incredible. Finally, it looks like there's an easier way across the Scott USA Moon Rocks. And just like the other parts of the course, following the other riders can be very important to your survival. The moon rocks are an unforgiving culprit of this track, but they do give the riders a chance to slow down and take a look around at the scenic beauty of the area. Once over the hill portion of the moon rocks, you're really in for a bumpy ride. We call it the Devil's Freeway. Thousands of years in the making, the pure rock landscaping gives way to some beautiful wildflowers and some not so beautiful beat up and dirty ATV racers. But beauty and wildflowers are not the prize of winning the Blackwater. It takes mud and guts just to finish this race. The rhododendron is a state flower of West Virginia and grows wild all over the Canaan Valley. Though riders in the race rarely have time to enjoy their setting. Hey, there's the guy we saw earlier with the American flag taped to his helmet. These helmet ornaments really help the riders' families to identify their brave dads, brothers, or children who's hiding deep beneath the coating of mud plastered to the clothing. Numbers don't work too well at the Blackwater. As the riders descend from the moon rocks and begin winding their way back towards town, they're about to encounter the most feared obstacle in off-road racing, the notorious Route 93 River Crossing and its thousands of fans known collectively as the Mud Fleas. They arrive by the truckloads and fill the waters as if a huge baptism were about to begin. They practice their tribal mud dance for hours before the riders appear at the east bank of the Route 93 river crossing. These are the mud fleas. On the opposite bank of the water, a human wall forms that the riders must climb into. Actually, the mud fleas are there to help the participants in the race to make it up the slippery banks of the river's edge. The climb becomes a hands-on experience for riders and fans alike. Many of the mud fleas have become so adept at helping the riders that they can catch a falling ATV in one hand and never even spill their beer. Three-wheelers were banned from competition by the American Motorcyclist Association a few years back. 
This guy snuck into the water for a few attempts at climbing the bank. After several unsuccessful tries, there was nothing left of his trike. Even though the mud fleas have a reputation for being just a little bit rowdy, most of the riders, myself included, would tell you without their help, you could never finish the Blackwater. Well, this portion of the Blackwater is by far my personal favorite. After the many times of witnessing this incredible mob scene at the Route 93 river crossing, I'm amazed at the spectator participation displayed in this scene. I mean, I've been a professional television and radio announcer in the motorcycle industry for a lot more years than I'd like to admit, and I've not seen this type of excitement. Well, I've rarely seen this type of excitement anywhere else in the world. And I would like to say that my hat is off to Dave and Rita Coombs and the Alpine Festival offices in Davis, West Virginia. They have made this Blackwater 100 ATV race the race it really is. And this is what they call unbelievable ATV racing excitement. As in any form of motorized racing, accidents do happen at the Blackwater 100. However, even with crashes like this, irritated eyes are the most common injury. Okay, here's how it works at Route 93. A rider must first take a try at climbing the bank himself. If you don't give it a shot, the mud fleas won't give you a hand. Second time through, they will reach for you, but nobody's really ready to jump in. Finally, a third try will get you more help from the mud fleas than you will ever need. So just sit back and enjoy the ride. Go! 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 Wow! He actually made it! Now that's what I call getting involved. A match made in heaven. Many men and one machine. After the Route 93 crossing, it's a sprint to the finish. Bob Sloan won the 1990 Blackwater 100 by two minutes over Pennsylvanians Norm Bish and Chuck DeLulo. Maryland's Teddy Trey placed fourth overall, while Missouri Honda rider Ricky Matson finished fifth. Bob Sloan, your champion. It's Father's Day morning, time for the Blackwater 100 motorcycle race. The riders meeting has adjourned and the streets are filled with riders and fans preparing for the 16th annual running of the bike race. The 1990 event will play host to nearly 500 competitors traveling from more than 30 states and Canada and about 25,000 fans. The favorite at this year's event is nine-time Grand National Champion Ed Lojack. Well, you know, the Blackwater, the, the race is so tough and there's so many different things out there that so much can happen. It, it's really hard to predict who's going to win, you know, because, uh, you know, just a little bit of luck can give a guy five or six minute lead, you know. So, you know, I look to do well, though. I'd like to be top five, top ten in my class. I'd be happy with that. There's Wheel Sports, Wally Wilson, a teammate of mine at KTM and a veteran of several Blackwater runs. And here's another KTM rider, Massachusetts, Tommy Norton. A lot of people will be passing out today for sure. Got to drink a lot of fluids. Anybody with a lot of water bottles is going to be in tough luck. I want to get top 10. It's, it's rocky. It's, um, it's real technical. You know, the bogs are a factor, but this year not so much that. I think just the rocks and everything. Well, I hope to win. Number one. Thank you. Thanks a lot. The bikes line up down the street five abreast with the first 25 rows reserved for the expert class riders. California Desert Star Larry Rossler has drawn the number one starting position and places his Kawasaki KX250 on the pole position next to the 125 KTM of relatively unknown Tom Norton. Just before the final countdown to takeoff begins, Rossler fouls a spark plug, killing his engine. He has just seconds to change the plug before 500 riders make their way into the first turn. Rossler got a hand to change the plug with seconds to spare. This is a crucial moment. Everybody's ready to start, and the number one rider on the pole position needs a spark plug. So Larry Rossler's mechanic goes to work, and the Blackwater referee delays the race briefly to allow for the change. 
As the others watch on, it's the California boy, the Desert Fox Larry Rossler from Irvine, California, who needs a little help to get started. Before the race, many predicted Larry Rossler would win this race overall, but there's no room for predictions at the Blackwater. Now we're ready to go, and the referee begins the five-second countdown. And it's Rossler getting the jump on Norton and the number 12 bike of Ohio's Gary Roach. There goes 125 cc ace Gene O'Neill on the inside. 85 race winner Terry Cunningham is second from left in this row. Here's West Virginia's own Timmy Coombs lighting off from the fourth row. And now a rooftop view of the dozens of rows that follow up the street. They will race down into the right-handed corner that will then lead them to the first river crossing, the shallow Beaver Creek crossing. From there, it will be four 25-mile loops around the valley. That's right, bud. Four grueling 25-mile loops totaling 100 miles of black water. And it's not necessarily how fast you go in a race like this, but how good your decisions are. The rider who wins this race has got to make good decisions. And like the ATVs from the day before, they will have to wait their turn to take a shot at the first crowded bank that lies on the other side of the water. Buddy, it's a little easier to see the rivers the riders wait to cross the first river crossing, unlike yesterday's situation before the ATV riders tried to cross. Less than half a mile out of town, the pack runs into their second obstacle. There's Cunningham on the Kawasaki taking a middle route. And behind him, Ohio's Gene O'Neill goes down on the 7 Yamaha. He barely makes it across the muck without sinking in. Here comes North Carolina's Steve McSwain on the number 28 KTM trying to make a pass on O'Neill. Number four is Tim Shepard, and a rider goes down. Can't tell who that is. Number 41 is Ohio Yamaha rider Jeff Russell, and there's Dave Fallis right behind him. Kentucky's Scott Summers goes by on his big four-stroker. Buren Hamrick and Jim Calliker take alternate lines around the side. And here's Ohio's Kevin Brown, a national championship contender on a KTM. That's rider number 231, Alan Bruto, Loretta Lynn's ranch manager, all the way from Hurricane Mills, Tennessee. It looks like this section of the racetrack has already begun to deteriorate. And here's Dirt Bike Magazine editor Ron Lawson finding a hot line right through the middle. Ron completed yesterday's ATV race and is trying to become the first rider ever to complete both the ATV and bike races on the same weekend. And here's the Swamp Duck, who is really Ohio's Craig Coon in disguise. Once out of this section, the riders must wade across the Camp 70 Ford the second time through the Blackwater River. After going through the muddy trenches, this second river crossing is a blessing in disguise. Number one, you can wash some of that heavy mud off your bike. And number two, you can get some cool relief from the summer's hot sun. There's one thing to watch out for in this particular river crossing. First, the large rocks hidden on the riverbed floor and the deep ruts that previous bikes created as they churn through the riverbed sand. Riders have to be careful in the water because one slip here can cause major damage. Oh, this guy's day is over. It sure is, Mark. Dropping that bike into the water like that can cause lots of havoc. We catch up with the leaders again about six miles out of town. There's a surprising new leader now as Norton has overtaken Rossler. This is only the second ever Blackwater 100 for the New Englanders. But he's certainly riding like a pro. No 125cc motorcycle has ever led this late into the race, much less ever got close to winning. We'll see if Norton can snap the losing streak. Tommy Norton on a KTM, the official sponsor of this year's Blackwater 100. If Tommy Norton can pull this off, KTM will be ecstatic. Winning the Blackwater is a real statement about the quality of a motorcycle, and KTM is certainly a well-built bike. And there's Rossler again, an early favorite. The Californian is making his second trip east for the event, having finished ninth overall in the 1988 version of America's Toughest Race. 
This is the last time that the cameras will be able to pick up Larry because the wires fried on his ignition after one lap. Summers is next on the big sports town USA, Honda XR600. And here's Jeff Russell getting some directions from a fan. Oh, careful there, JR. Iron Man Tommy Harris, third place in Saturday's mountain bike race, is a convincing fourth, followed by Russ Graves, Shepard, and Georgia KTM rider Alan Gravitt. This portion of the Blackwater track is really tricky. As you can see, a rider can be just cruising along until all of a sudden the earth gives way beneath the bike. It's like trying to walk on water when your bike hits a mud hole, and there's no telling where a mud hole will appear. No more than a dozen bikes have gone through this section, and you can see how bad it's getting out there. As Buddy says, the more bikes that go through this section of the Blackwater, the more torn up the swampy ground becomes, making it more and more difficult to stay on the motorcycle. What's the guy pushing? That's Pennsylvania's Rick Kresick. He's been down this trail before. Kresick leads the vet expert class in the championship standings. Now this guy here has got himself in an interesting predicament. He's managed to lodge himself into the middle of a large bush. If he gets out of this one, he only has to look forward to more swamp land ahead. This guy was lucky to get help this far out. And here's the swamp duck once again. He looks things over, drops down in. Go. 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 You think he's going to make it, Mark? Of course, bud. He's the swamp duck. Good call. The swamp duck's through. Other guys are having more trouble. Just when you think you've got it licked, the bug grabs you by the wheels again, and it's back to pushing. And pushing seems to be the smartest way to get through these mud ruts. Did you see how easy that one guy had it a little earlier? When stuck in mud, walk it out. The rescue squad finds another lucky victim. Lucky victim is the right words for such, except in this case, I think these guys are having a little bit of trouble deciding exactly how to get this bike out of the hole. Now, this is what they call gassing it through the mud. Just look at the amount of mud, water, and grass flying from the back wheel of that motorcycle. Great video footage by the Moto Video Camera crews. That's right, time again for Route 93, home of the mud fleas. Two years ago, we tried to broadcast from the middle of that church-like atmosphere. Our network personnel never came back. First through, it's Scott Summers, who goes right at the heart of the mud fleas. He gets two thumbs up for that effort. Norton has also come through, and soon the river will be full of unsuspecting riders. If these guys aren't pumped up for some serious partying tonight, then my name isn't Larry Huffman. This camera footage of the scene at Route 93 is some of the best ever videotaped. I've got to say that I don't envy any rider who would have to ride into this group of hungry for action mobsters. But it seems that all this is in great fun, and respect for the riders is number one at the Blackwater's Route 93 river crossing. The approach to this obstacle can be as treacherous as the bank on the other side. One false move, and it's over the bars, right in front of thousands of friends. This rider got pointed into a hole by the fans of the East Bank. Even with help, he's not very happy with the people that have duped him, so he's going to get even with the mud fleas over there. Catch this if you can. The Route 93 River Crossing is appropriately sponsored by Scott USA. Believe me, with Scott goggles to protect your eyes, the Blackwater 100 would not be the same. While the back markers are playing catch with the mud fleas, the leaders have entered town. It's still Norton, a member of the controversial FAH-Q racing team from New England. Summers is right on his tail, followed closely by Yamaha teammates Lojack and Russell. McSwain is next, followed by... Hey, that's me! There you go, Mark Hyde, fifth after the first lap. What was going through your mind after your first hour of Blackwater? I was just trying to hang in there, scout the course out, look over the bad spots, 
ride smart, and I was right with Ed Lojack, so as long as I figured I was with Ed, I was in good shape. You know, just hang back and let the others make the mistakes. Dirt Rider Magazine's Joe Colombero knows exactly what that feels like. I hate Dave Coombs. I hate Rita Coombs. This is a race from hell. Kids, don't try this at home. This race is for professional lunatics only. Yeah. So you're having a good time? Yeah, I'm actually having a ball. I've got a flat tire. I've been stuck in the mud like 5,000 times, but it's great. If I could just keep the bike running, I'd do fine. I gotta go, I'll see you later. Boy, that says it all. Speaking of magazine editors, the editors of Dirt Wheels and Dirt Bike magazines have been of major help in reporting the ins and the outs of the Blackwater 100 over the years. The producers of this video and the folks at Racer Productions would like to thank Dirt Bike, Dirt Wheels, and Cycle News for their support of the Blackwater. As the track deteriorates further, riders begin looking for any way possible across the bogs. Here's West Virginia's Spanky Z. He thinks he's found a hot line over a makeshift bridge. Spanky obviously forgot what Dave Coombs told everyone at the riders' meeting. What's that, Mark? Hey, if God had meant for them to be bridges at the Blackwater, he'd have built them himself. This guy forgot Dave's other theory. Which is? If there were meant to be jumps across the bogs, he'd have made ramps. Dave's been doing this Blackwater 100 for a long time, guys, and if I were riding out there today, I'd listen to everything he has to say. So what's the best way across, Mark? Hit it straight, hit it fast, and hit it before someone else hits it. You can say that again, Mark, because the first one across won't have to worry about taking another line across in order to avoid the guy who tries it first. In other words, it's a no-win, all-lose proposition, sometimes when you ride the Blackwater 100. It's one thing to jump across and another thing to stay on your bike after you get across. But most importantly, don't get stuck because it may take some time to get you out. Just about everybody across this mud bog is going to have a tough time. Accepting this fact is sometimes the hardest thing to do. So it's jump, land, slide, slip, or get stuck. Then with lots of humility, accept the fact that this muddy situation is going to take lots of effort to get out of it. This guy may have had to push it out, but at least he didn't land upside down. Here's a true veteran, Tom Harris, having no trouble whatsoever. Local favorite, Rob Cease, should be so lucky. Hey, that's Dave Coombs with a radio and an orange vest on. He never helped me out before. You probably have never been stuck like that. You wanna bet? Meanwhile, back at Route 93, some riders are having trouble before they even get to the bank.
Let's check with Tim Carter over in Davis for a race update. Here comes Summers. Summers into the pit area. Here we are in the Scott Summers pit area. Scott coming in. Norton just came through the number one position. Summers is doing some work on his rear wheel. His rear brake system going bad to Summers. The white flag is out, which means that Summers has to keep that thing together for about another hour. He's still about a minute ahead. Norton and Lojack passed Scott while he was in the pit area. So Scott Summers pulling out of the pit area. About a minute and a half pit time for Scott Summers, an adjustment of the rear brake. New goggles, hoses himself down. He takes off in the number three position. That's Norton the race being called live by Tim Cotter as the spectators line the street for the finish of this year's Blackwater 100. Norton raced across the finish line with a shocking upset win. The first ever in Blackwater 100 history for a 125cc motorcycle. In the excitement of it all, Norton almost went through the wrong scoring barrel. Tommy Norton on the KTM wins the Blackwater 100. And what a ride by the Massachusetts native. An unpredicted winner of this year's Blackwater as Tim Norton makes his way to the staging area. I'd like to thank Wiseco High Performance Pistons, Yokohama Tires, Scott USA, KTM Motorcycles, Dirt Bike and Dirt Wheels Magazines, and Cycle News for their support of this Blackwater video presentation. The results of this year's Blackwater race are as follows. KTM's Thomas Norton, he was first. KTM's Mark Hyde, second. In third place, Yamaha's Tim Shepard. Finishing fourth, Honda's Scott Summers. Fifth, Yamaha's Frank Keegan. And sixth, KTM's Alan Gravitt and the other Blackwater finishers. For Buddy Little and Mark Hyde, I'm Larry Huffman signing off from the race portion of this Blackwater 100 video. See you next year. Not me, buddy. I tell you what, I'm impressed. And now, from the Alpine Festival, hopefully with a towel, this young lady is going to present you with your trophy, and Rod Bush is going to present you with something you might like almost as much. <laughs> no, you get your trophy first. Hold it up. Okay, he'll do it. The Wilver All Winner. Also, this trophy goes out in memory of Anita Barker, the lady that helped put this all together for many, many years. Rod Bush, let me jump over here. Tom, on behalf, on behalf of KTM America, I'd like to congratulate you on your great Blackwater 100 win. I'd also like to present you with a $1,000 check from KTM Woo! Contingency. It's back in, my, back in my office. I'll send it to you, bud. Make sure I got your address. Congratulations. Hey, Rod, what I want to know. <laughs> hey, next year at contract time, will you know who Tom Norton is? There'll be no question about that one. <laughs> Amazing what winning a Blackwater will do for you, huh? If it would have been tougher, would we have switched spots here? Uh, you can't take anything away from you. Win this race, buddy. You had to ride, you know. That's a real champion that says it like that. I'm sure that you have known Tom Norton. You know, I'd never heard of him. You know, me either. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I thought maybe since you were, were with KTM and he was too, you might have heard of him. Yeah, I have now, you know, it's one of those things in 79 when I won it, nobody heard of me, so hopefully there's good things in front for him. You're right, I was there and I said, Mark who, that kid from Ohio, it's exactly what I said. Well, congratulations on a great ride. Two KTMs, one and two. Also, I would like to, you know, thank Dave Coombs for putting on an excellent event, and Rod Bush, president of KTM, and Mike Rosso for all being here. You know, there's not too many presidents of motorcycle companies you see here on a day like today. That's no kidding, he didn't even give you a thousand dollar check and you thanked him. I shook my hand. Well, that's, a, that's probably as good. Come on up here, Tim Shepard.
This guy may not have won today, but with a third here, you're still the leader of our series. Yeah, I think so. That's what I was mainly doing is just pushing, uh, trying to stay ahead of uh, JR and Eddie, and I seen Eddie on the hill broke, and that just gave me a lot of relief. Then I caught Marky in the bogs and passed him there, then made a few mistakes, and Mark got back around me, and a big mistake at 93. What happens out at 93? Uh, they was lined up, waiting to go in on, a, on the bank, and I just took and jumped in the mud and stuck her. <laughs> and stuck her? You got it. <laughs> little, a little over anxious or what? Yeah, I knew Marky was coming, and I had to push, and uh, I knew that he would, might have get me on the time, so I tried to make it up through the back, and I caught him through town, so we was kind of racing through town, which we shouldn't have been doing, but we, I didn't know. I thought we was going for the lead, too. <laughs> well, how was it as far as uh, your Blackwater memories go? Uh, it's fairly easy. I like the course, though. It was uh, good, fast. I like fast courses, and uh, the bike worked excellent. The tires, fantastic. And so another Blackwater 100 comes to a close. The valley will return to its usual serenity while the townspeople reminisce about those crazy dirt bikers. But in one year, they will all be back. The beginnings of the Blackwater 100 were kind enough. In 1974, a country preacher attended one of Dave Coombs' motocross races and asked Coombs about the possibilities of having one in his little community, Davis, West Virginia. The preacher and the promoter even went to see a motorcycle movie together on any Sunday in order to get a feel for how the race should be run. The two thought that a Grand Prix style race through the streets of the town and the surrounding countryside would be special enough to attract visitors to Davis. Now, 17 years later, the Blackwater 100 is the biggest off-road race in America. Throughout the years, the event has been helped along by numerous racing personalities. A group of magazine editors from California once attended on a dare by Coombs, Rick Super Hunky Simon, Tom Webb, Paul Clipper, and Vic Krause gave the event national exposure for the first time after they found it to be America's toughest race. Now the Blackwater 100 is one of the most highly publicized events of the year.
Grace continues in a large part due to the efforts of the Alpine Festival and the city of Davis, West Virginia. Each year, they organize the town and make the participants and the spectators stay in Davis an enjoyable one. Dave and Rita Coombs and the Racer Productions Company still handle the running of the actual race itself. All other credits aside, the one person who deserves credit for this race taking place is Anita Love Barton. Anita was a West Virginian if there ever was one, and her help in organizing this event for the past 10 years or so was without equal. The Blackwater 100 goes on as part of the late Mrs. Barton's legacy to the town of Davis. This video is dedicated to her memory. Here we are, race fans, in the KTM pit area with Kevin Hines, a one-time champion here at Blackwater, although he's been here five times. He's left with a bridesmaid uh, four of those five times. Kevin, a, a, a good day for racing here. There's no rain. There's no rain in the forecast, and we haven't had rain in several days. Uh, uh, dry Blackwater, perhaps. I, I'm a little disappointed about that. I enjoy it when it's torrential rains and muddy, and that's why I come to the Blackwater, really. There's also a lot of things behind the scenes that you have to do that people don't look at other than jogging or running or weightlifting. Uh, you also have to prep your bike and you have to choose the right equipment. Yeah, I choose Scott goggles. They're uh, the choice I've made several years ago and I've been with the company for four years now using Scott. I think visibility is very important, especially in a sport like this where you're getting in the mud in different conditions, dust. and So we have a new system here called the EFS. It's an electronic film system that advances automatically with a battery pack in it and a little motor drive. It's really state of the art. They're the only company that builds something like this. And then we have a new setup here called the Quick Load, which it, it takes the tear-offs, these real thin pieces of, I guess they're Mylar or Lexan, and you load them in. They're simple simple to do where the other systems you need long fingernails or a girlfriend that can load them for you where this is a real simple system and on top of all their durability and their high quality they look good also you're looking good when you're out on the racetrack <laughs> and that means a lot yeah that's right and i think bevo's a good man he's the one that brought me in to wearing the scott and i he stands behind me and i help him well kevin good luck today in the in the 1990 edition of the blackwater 100 and maybe it will be your second win of these Blackwater uh, runs here at Canaan Valley. I hope so, thank you. Well, I'm Tim Cotter, along with Kevin Hines in the KTM pit. This race is being presented to you by Scott USA. For the complete line of Scott products, write Scott USA, P.O. Box 2030, Sun Valley, Idaho, 83353, or call toll-free from anywhere in America, 1-800-635-6387. Scott USA. We're here right now with Tim Coombs, the winner of the 1988 Blackwater 100. Tim, of course, this is billed as the toughest race in America. How were you able to pull off that win in 1988, and how are you uh, planning to do it here this year? Well, uh, in 88, I was on a, an open bike, and I was riding with Wiseco pistons and a, basically a stock bike. This year, I'm riding a brand new open bike. It's nothing, it's all stock except for an Olin shock and Wiseco pistons. When you get out there, You'll be riding fast, and then you'll be riding slow. You'll be riding through water and mud and everything, and your piston piston walls and everything will expand and, and contract. And with the Weissco piston, it doesn't do that as much as regular pistons. They're a lot lighter. They have they have uh, uh, shorter wrist pins and everything in the middle of the bike, which is is mostly all your weight. And with the Weissco piston, and you're you're riding for five hours, you know you can't go wrong. So durability. Uh, when you mention the Weisco piston, durability is a big, big factor in this really long 100-mile race. Yeah, of course. I wouldn't want to go out there with stock pistons and stuff. Well, it'd be all right, but why chance it, you know? So the Weisco piston is definitely uh, a big advantage for you. Yes, it's, it's, it's pretty much shaped like a, a stock piston, but they've uh, run that kind of stuff through flow benches and stuff, and they've got it set up to where it's, it's your best bet. There's no way to go wrong with one. So the Weisco Piston is going to help you out here in your quest for a second Blackwater victory. I hope so. Well, we wish you the best of luck, Tim, and thanks for stopping by and talking with us. Thank you. Weisco, 7201 Industrial Park Boulevard, Mentor, Ohio, 44060. Call them at 1-800-321-1364.
KTM 1906 Broadway, Lorain, Ohio 44052. Call 216 246 1060 or 619 258 6300. On your Yamaha machine uh, powered with uh, some Yokohama rubber on it, uh, had to give you some advantage, what you call the unfair advantage. You got it. It definitely uh, held up all day. I think it really gave me off, definitely gave me the advantage on the off cambers uh, <clears throat> and the muddy slick stuff. It just hooked up and never, never slipped once all day. Coming off the start, as if you were on the motorcycle, what were your thoughts coming off the start and through the first river crossing? Uh, main thing to do is just to make it through safe, get it up on the dry ground, uh, keep it running because uh, it's a long time after that. You got four laps, it's a long race, so got to keep her dry. What's down the road for Tim Shepard and the Team Yamaha pit crew? Uh, hopefully I want a couple more wins. Uh, I'm going to train hard. I don't get to train enough because I'm working, uh, you know, a lot of hours during the week, but I'm going to start training more and, uh, there's nothing to say, but the bike's just excellent. I mean, it's just you don't have to do anything to it. Just maintain it and put Yokohamas on it and go. Yokohama Tires, 50 Division Street East, Suite 200, Summersville, New Jersey, 08876. Call them toll-free, 1-800-678-9656.